What's up, everybody? Hey, we're back. Welcome back to Music Maniacs with Side After Dark. Yeah. We're Side After Dark. Uh-huh. And if you're wondering who we are, we're a band, mm-hmm. right? We make music. Yeah. We live in New York City. We We've do. We've been playing music in New York City for a couple years now. Yeah. And this is something you should know about us. We love music <laughs> of all kinds, of all styles. Yeah. And all we want to do is talk about music. All the time. So we started the Music Maniacs podcast for exactly that reason. Yeah. To talk about the best musicians, to tell you their stories, if you don't know them already. And that's what we're doing right now. We are. Some of it may be true. Some of it may be made up. You got to figure it out. It's up to you. If you really love that musician, you would dive deeper anyway. Consider us the gateway. That's right. <laughs> so on this episode... We're talking about one of the most legendary guitar players ever that has ever existed. Uh huh. A man by the name of Carlos Santana. Do you know him? Do you? <laughs> do you know him like we know him? Which is not at all. <laughs> well, if you do, if you want to find out more about Carlos Santana and why he's so awesome, then you should probably keep watching. Yeah. We gotta bring it back to Mexico. We do. The Jalisco? state of Jalisco. Uh huh. He was born there, mm-hmm. July twentieth. Yeah. Nineteen forty-seven. He was. I could have sworn that Carlos was either Cuban or Puerto Rican. I just never thought he was Mexican, and still to this day, I won't accept it. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Are you calling him a fake Mexican? <laughs> he is. Stop fronting, okay? <laughs> We know. Okay, we know. Um, so, yeah, Carlos was born in the state of Jalisco. Uh-huh. It's a state. It's not a city. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the city. It was a small town. Yeah. Um, Mexico is just so huge. I can't even believe that. It's like states and states and states. I thought. Yeah. I feel like it's more like provinces. Yeah. The province of Jalisco. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so he's born there, 1947. Yeah. Good time to be born if you're a musician. I think so, too. Because uh, we'll get into it, but as time goes on, a lot of good musical things are going to be happening as he's a young man. You're on the cusp of rock and roll, and like I like to say, the mid to late 40s are really good for music. Big sounds, big bands, definitely mm-hmm. inspiring for those people listening on that new kind of thing that we called radio <laughs> back in that time. That new groundbreaking device. <laughs> Radiation. Right. Just kidding. That's what it's short for, right? <laughs> yeah, damn right. It's got to be. <laughs> But um, so so Carlos was born into a musical family. Uh huh. His dad was a mariachi. Yes, he was. I believe his dad was as well. Yeah. Um. So he had been surrounded by music literally his entire life. Yeah. He first picked up a violin when he was like four or five. Yep. Yep. Four or five years old. That's insane. And then just you know casually graduated to another instrument at eight. An instrument we only we like to call the guitar. What's that? I never, I never heard of that. It's a new thing. Some of the kids know what it is. Some people don't. But um, we'll let you know later on in the broadcast exactly what this guitar, guitar, is. <laughs> Get on the wave, people. <laughs> but yeah, so um, so they um moved to Tijuana. Yes. Which is right on the border. Right. Basically so, America. Yeah. So there's a lot of... He was saying that a lot of the musical influences that he got there were from like the border towns mm-hmm. and like the stuff that they were playing, you know, for people like kind of on the run, maybe outlaws. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. As, if you will. Still early times in American history, you know, mm-hmm. before the government and FDR and uh, Hoover and all those people really rained down terror on you. Before they got all those trackers that live in your pocket. Exactly. And are also filming us right now. Right. Before they (laughs) admitted that they had them. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, so they moved up there and um, he, his musical influences started to expand. He started really getting into like the, the classic like blues musicians. Yes. Yeah. So this is like... John Lee Hooker, mm-hmm. you know, a whole bunch of B.B. Uh, King he was interested in. A we lot got of those, the King. That's right. We're not talking Elvis. The King of BBs and not guns. That's okay? right. The King of Blues Blues. I think the B is for Bullet Bullet. <laughs> yeah. Bullet Bullet King. Oh, <laughs> bullet that, Bullet King. That's a great name. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, I would not fuck with that guy. <laughs> Me neither. He... What's up? I'm Bullet King. I'd be like, uh, yeah, you are. I'm not going to find out. Get down. Bullet Bullet's coming. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, so so he got really into that that music, and mm-hmm. that's around the time that he switched to the guitar. Yeah. 
and he literally was saying he would like his whole as a kid he would just be going around to people mr mr you want a song for 50 cents yeah like that was what he was doing like he was growing up on the streets just playing music for people yeah it's pretty awesome and when you're just like generally generationally like vetted into a family you already can feel your talent and you already kind of know you have it that's somebody i could say okay i know he knew he had it because that's all he knew like you know what i mean with his father and his grandfather like so he was able to just get out there and be like hey you're not doing the right thing wake up and listen to me (laughs) i'm carlos santana uh more or less yeah but it's really interesting like he he is one of the most spiritual people that i've ever like listened to yeah um and he talks about something all the time that i think about um i don't remember if i asked you this have you ever read of the book the war of art yeah you know um so a brief um explanation so that that's all about um you know art and it's really if you're a person that's creating anything you should read this book Mm -hmm. um it's all about you know the process of creating things correct and um it's really not from you all the ideas that you're having are from this this spiritual plane that we exist in and it's really just up to you to be open to the ideas yes um basically the whole idea is like these these ideas are not starting with you you're just receptive to them exactly and carlos is like a perfect example of this yeah because when he talks about he talks about all the time like I just let the music flow through me. Like, mm-hmm. I'm a conduit of the music. He doesn't talk about, I do this, I do that. He says, the music does this. Exactly. The music does that. Yeah. And he's just on that spiritual wave. And you can tell, just listening to him, if you've ever seen an interview with him, you know that he really lives on that vibration. Like, it's he's true. not he's not putting this on to be like, oh, I'm like a hippie kind of guy. Like, that's just really how he is. And he really, like experiences that and he lets the music flow through him as much as he possibly can yeah and i definitely believe that too because there are times when i can think of like a catchy tune or a catchy hook and i don't use them and months later i'll hear somebody else use them whether Mm -hmm. it's in a popular song or not and it's like they didn't steal it out of your brain Mm -hmm. they actually were just open to it and were like let me just use it it came from somewhere Uh uh-huh so so it's actually really interesting so after after um growing up in mexico they moved to san francisco yes right and this is what we were saying before this was a the time period was a very good time to mm-hmm. be there as far as music is concerned because mm-hmm. we're talking about light what 1965 right san francisco there's so much music going on exactly exactly and he like many uh big artists he unlike many big artists i should say did not see the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, and that did not inspire him to become a huge, huge star. He actually just opened himself up to African rhythms, to jazz, to rock and roll, to more Latin rhythms, and Mm -hmm. because he was so open, like you were saying before, he kind of started making himself become that instrument. Yeah, and it's really interesting, like like I was saying before, so when he first got into San Francisco, he started up a band, right, mm-hmm. um, with a fellow named Greg Rowley. Yes. Going to go with Rowley. I'm not sure if it's Raleigh or Rowley, but I'm sticking with Rowley. <laughs> okay? Deal with it. Um, and they originally started the Santana Blues Band. Right. And it was a little more just like straightforward blues. Yeah. And, you know, they were, you know, decently successful. But he was saying that basically once he stopped thinking about what he was doing and just became open to the music then he became drawn to all these other things and kind of expanding the sound of it yeah like you know bringing in the percussion bringing in the different rhythms right and letting and kind of following the music yeah and that is when he they really found the sound that became so distinctive to them is yeah. when he kind of shut off the me yeah. and just went with the music yeah yeah you know? which is cool and have you guys ever met the music you gotta meet it pretty cool you gotta hang out with the muse sometimes <laughs> but yeah so he started to uh, he developed this band he was sick and tired of uh working so he decided to become a full-on guitarist around 1966-ish or something yeah, yeah. no more washing dishes okay tell that man i retire <laughs> <laughs> cuban santana in the house um yes yeah, so, so he he basically he went there and he even um he had gotten into college, and he was like, "I'm not doing that." No, no. <laughs> like, come on, I know what I'm. I know what I'm here to do. Yeah, yeah. You know what's funny? Um, they mentioned his middle school, and uh, the last name. I, I think it's maybe John, but the name of the last name of the school was Lick, and mm. only a guitarist could go to Lick Middle School. <laughs> only a world class guitarist. That's could where go he there. learned all his licks. Exactly. <laughs> And um, so they started playing around, and now, like we're saying, we're, they're expanding the sound. They're adding a lot more people into the band. They're yes. getting percussionists, keyboard, drums, all this, all this stuff. Yeah. 
And now they're really starting to, people are like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I've never heard music like this. Yeah, lots more notoriety. And San Francisco, even to this day, is a big hub for great music. Mm. So, yes, it was back then, too. And damn, people really liked them. And then somebody else noticed them. Somebody, well, first, somebody by the name of Bill Graham. Yes, not superstar Billy Graham, the wrestler. <laughs> well, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. We, we don't know for sure. I hope we get a photo of that. <laughs> oh, oh, there'll be a photo. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, so he, uh, Bill Graham was a big time music promoter. Yes. Um, he had a, he ran a couple of venues in, I believe the West Coast and the East Coast, the mm-hmm. Fillmore East, East Fillmore mm-hmm. West, like mm-hmm. all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And you know, he was kind of a big deal and he obviously really liked them. Yeah. And he introduced them to another giant musical figure. Uh-huh. By the name of who? Cleve. Cleve Davis. Cleve Davis. <laughs> a guy by the name of Clive Davis. <laughs> Who definitely deserves his own podcast. Yes, yes. Clive Davis has been involved with... The amount of successful artists that Clive Davis has been involved with, it's almost a joke. It's it like, is. you read the list, it's like, how is this even possible from one person? Yeah, I'm going to call Clive Davis's middle name Reaping the Benefits. <laughs> That's a long middle name. <laughs> for, Clive for a grand <laughs> man, Clyde Reaping the Benefits Davis. Davis. <laughs> Yeah, um, so he got introduced to Clive, and he signed them. Yeah, to Colombia. And Colombia. Mm-hmm. Wait. To not Mexico. Is he Mexican, or is he Cuban, or is he Colombian? I'm getting... Stop lying, Carlos. <laughs> Goodness. Tell us the real story. <laughs> I'm from Spain. <laughs> <laughs> España. Um, yeah, yeah, so he, they got signed, mm-hmm. and they started doing you know a bunch of tours and stuff, and doing shows. But they weren't getting, like, national attention. No. But they were soon to get some national attention. Yep, yep. Because due to, you know, the people that they knew, you know, the, the Bill Grahams and the Clive Davises, yeah. they got booked um, to do this small festival in upstate New York <laughs> that you may have heard of. Uh, it goes by the name of Woodstock. Yeah. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of woods and yeah. a lot of livestock. Probably, yeah. So they played with animals on stage. Yes. And some timber. Yes. Yeah. They lit fires on the stage. Oh, wait. That was Woodstock 99. <laughs> oh, my bad. My bad. I'm getting ahead of ourselves here. Um, so, so, yeah. So, they, they played Woodstock. Mm-hmm. And when they played Santana at Woodstock, we were talking about this right before we went on. I have never seen a man more possessed by the music than this video yeah. of them playing at Woodstock. Yeah. And the story behind it is insane. Yes. You watched, I really wish we could just have the whole, we could play the whole thing and react to it right here, but right. we get copyrighted for exactly. sure. Exactly. Um, but he's, af- they're absolutely tearing up the entire stage. And you can tell looking at them that they're all just right connected with each other. Yes. Yeah. So the instruments are on all cylinders too. Mm-hmm. The instruments are playing themselves. They're actually just standing there with their hands up and they're that, like on the wave. That's basically what happened. <laughs> but it's crazy because you can look at the footage and just be like, wow, they're absolutely tearing this up. I've mm-hmm. never seen this. This is amazing. And the whole crowd is feeling it. You can just tell looking at this footage, just like the energy is amazing. Yeah. And then you find out the backstory uh-huh. and it gets even crazier. <laughs> Let us know. So apparently <laughs> when they got to the festival, mm-hmm. they were told that they had a lot of time before mm-hmm. they're set. So like three hours or something like that. Well, more than that, like, okay. like eight hours. Okay. And they were like, the whole band was like, Let's drop some acid. Why not? We We're got at time. Woodstock. Yeah. Yeah, we got time, mm-hmm. right? Well, so they drop the acid, mm-hmm. and then as they're, you know, starting to begin their trip, <laughs> the promoter comes in, hey, sorry, guys, you're, you're getting bumped up. You go on in like an hour. <laughs> this is a setup. And they're like, oh, my God. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. This is not good. That's why they were all on the same plane, because they were all like... Holy shit. <laughs> no, 100%. They yeah. were all tripping balls. <laughs> They're all just looking over at each other like, can you believe this shit? <laughs> but yeah, so they, they get on the stage in front of like, whatever it is, 300,000, 400,000 people. Small amount. Tripping balls. Oh, yeah. But you can't turn back. No. You're already there. So uh-huh. they, they play the show and they just absolutely rip it. They kill it. They completely kill it. And Carlos, you, you can see, you can look these up, up these interviews with him. He was just like, I was... <laughs> I was tripping so hard. My guitar was just like an electric snake. Yeah. And all I was trying to do was just keep it here with me. And I just said, please, God, just let me stay in tune and in time. That's all. (laughs) I'll never do this again. I swear to God, please (laughs) just do this for me, God. (laughs) The infamous quote of the young and dumb. 
<laughs> I'll never do this again. I'll never do this again. It's a lie. And there's even interviews with the other band members that are so funny. Like there was the one guy, I don't know what his name, the the, the, the little dude yeah. that was the percussion player. Who said he saw God? He literally was like, I went on this stage and I saw I saw Jesus' face <laughs> and I touched Jesus' face. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. These guys were all so high. This is crazy. And it's one thing to be super high. You Anyone can get super high. Yeah. It's another thing to get super high and rock a stage of the biggest music festival that's ever existed in that that point in time exactly do you know who was there everyone talking mamas and papas hendrix all right everybody not the doors they were they were too cool for that shit yeah they don't fuck with wood <laughs> they closed the door on that shit that's right <laughs> ah <laughs> um yeah so basically their, the performance was filmed, like a, a lot of Woodstock was filmed. You know, they put out the Woodstock album and the Woodstock movie. Yeah. And their performance in that immediately catapulted them to huge success. I mean, yeah. that based, back in the day, that was like the equivalent of going viral. Yeah, yeah. Um, Carlos was like, we got really big, like you too big. And that is huge. You yeah. know, that stadium huge, arena huge. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. So, yeah. So, and then um, for it to be like more word of mouth and just radio, that's insane too. Yeah. And it just, they just spread like wildfire. And, you know, with fame and notoriety and all that stuff comes, you know, sobriety. Sobriety. Okay? All the band members just got more and more sober the bigger they got. Yes. Yep. And they yep. all had the same vision of what they wanted the music to be. Exactly. And nobody accidentally killed anybody either. Like, you know. Wait, what? Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's the, um? I call him Double M because I couldn't remember the name, but they have. Michael McDonald? <laughs> no. <laughs> Whoever their um, artist is who um, they broke up because that person was charged for involuntary manslaughter. So we had to leave the Oh, band. Manson? No, oh, wait. Oh, not Manson. Oh, oh, Molly? Mm-mm. Fuck. Hold on. All right. So it was their band member, Marcus Malone, who was charged with involuntary manslaughter. So needless to say, I'll say it anyway. He couldn't go on tour. He couldn't do any more. Yeah. <laughs> he had some things going on. Prison will keep you from tour. <laughs> yeah. So so now they're huge. Yeah. They're putting out music. They put out, I believe, three albums from the original like classic lineup, like yeah. Santana. Mm-hmm. And then you know, things slowly started to break apart. Yeah, yeah. Um, some people said, these keyboards need to breathe. I <laughs> Greg. need, Greg's like, you know, I'm, I'm getting more into these keyboards. This is pretty awesome. We need to get a hard hitting guitar, some high, high vocals. And then Santana's like, what? I'm feeling some congas, man. Yeah, I'm feeling yeah. a little saxophone. I'm feeling a little more Latin African rhythm with some blues. And then there was a bit of a clash. And other bands were formed. See, this is the thing about Greg Rowley, is that he'll never stop believing. Never, never. Because he went on to form a little band called Journey after this. Small band, you may have Small heard of band. it. Small band, small band. But yeah, so basically, I mean, long story short, uh, Greg, who was a co-founder of the band, yeah, he wanted to stay more of like a hard rock blues type sound. Yeah. And Carlos is really expanding and trying to do all kinds of he's trying to get more into jazz he's trying to get more into this he's trying to get more into that basically everything but a hard blues sound right um so eventually it's like all right well we're just gonna we're gonna go our separate ways yeah and And, that's cool yeah i mean not only that but also you know there are drug issues coming and Mm -hmm. drugs never help and at this at the same time um one of the percussionists is kind of like whispering in carlos's ear like hey man you know you should take more control of the band you know this (laughs) it is named after you you know you you should start telling everybody what to do you know what i mean so there's just a lot of things going on where the original lineup of the band didn't really last no after that not at all yeah happens to santana and raleigh Rowley. That's true. <laughs> but yeah, so it's no longer Santana Blues Band. It's Santana. We're moving. Um, the first couple of albums when they were Santana Blue Band, Blues Band didn't really give them that big of a notoriety, but... Well, they were Santana the whole time. They were. They changed from Santana Blues Band before they got big. Yeah, once they hit Woodstock, they were around. Yeah, they were somewhere Santana. around there, yeah. Yeah, and then that Woodstock took them to a whole nother level. Mm-hmm. And now um, Santana is getting more into jazz, too, and like other types of music. Jazz, thinking about Miles Davis. Oh, he loves Miles Davis. Yeah. Oh, shout out to Miles. He's here. We got Miles in that studio with us today, everybody. Everybody make some noise for Miles Davis. <laughs> I came to make sure you're not talking shit about me. 
got to see the right things. Talk about Miles. Yeah. So after, yeah. So after the Woodstock album, after they disbanded, quote unquote, got some new members in, we're doing the next album, which is. No, that was with the original. That was one of the original three Abraxas, I believe. Why am I tripping up on my knowledge here? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but that one was critically acclaimed, that album. Yes, that was, yeah, a, that was yeah. right after Woodstock. It was Santana. The first album was Santana. Yeah. Called Santana. Yeah. Then it was Abraxas. Then it was Santana 3. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. And then they... And then that... And then they... Pfft. Okay, then they dismantle. Okay, that's, after, it comes in threes. I should have known that. That's the official term. Is they went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but it's really interesting um, when you talk about like the Santana story. Mm-hmm. In this part, after the original band, people act like Santana fell off. Yeah, but he really didn't. No. Like the first three albums, they were like. I mean, they went number one. They had huge hit singles. And after that, you know, they weren't as commercially successful, but Santana was still touring all over the world, playing shows for everybody. This is why I love him. You know why? He didn't get too big on you. Well, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. And like uh, Bill Graham was pretty much begging him to stick to the original format and Mm -hmm. stuff. But Santana definitely wanted to branch out and do more. And I love this kind of story. I love when you're not necessarily hitting top 40 all the time, but you can still book shows and fill out crowds. That's where you make a lot of money. It's it's funny you say that because that is literally what Clive Davis said to him. Yeah. He... he, um, Carlos was like, yeah, I want to do this. And Clive was just kind of like, that's cool, but you won't be top 40 anymore. <laughs> that's all I'm about. <laughs> Can't you check this suit out? Yeah. So, so you know, he, he continued to make music. Yeah. Um, that just wasn't as commercially successful. But it doesn't really matter. Because the whole thing with him is like, he only cares about the music. I love I it. I really feel, again, you can look any interview with him. Just the way that he talks and the way that he carries himself. You know that he's just about the vibe. Mm-hmm. He's just about the music. There he... As far as famous musician goes, he has to have some of the lowest level of ego that I've ever seen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, he is definitely about the art. So for him to be able to play music and to be able to bring that music that only he can make to the people, that is success. Yeah. Like, if he never sold another album again, he would have been successful. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't even like to talk about this, like, middle period, like, he fell off, because he didn't. It's like, what is success? Mm -hmm. What is falling off? Mm -hmm. Just because you're not on top 40 doesn't mean you're successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And look at all the other artists he worked with. Some juggernauts in the music industry. John McLaughlin, um, Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock. And he can talk to all talk about all these people really personally. Mm-hmm. It's not like about just about music. It's about like you're saying, like the vibe and how they gel together. And definitely made him uh, a better artist, in my opinion. Like that kind of jazz fusion, like those rhythms and stuff like that. The only band I can think of besides that is like Traffic too. Mm-hmm. And those they used to play the bill with them as well. Like you know Steve Winwood too. Like you yeah. know. And like I just think that that's one of the greatest things about being a music maker. Mm -hmm. you know is that you can just you can decide where you want to go without deciding like he said you know what's gonna be the correct hit what words do i write that are gonna make people want to buy make this platinum or whatever and he did reach platinum status without being like you know top 40 or anything like that Mm -hmm. so so what clive what you got now (laughs) yeah clive (laughs) what do you know anyway (laughs) Yeah, so I mean, he literally, like I said, he continued to tour the world. Yeah. I mean, he it's not like he the original band disbanded and then he was like destitute and right. then and then came back. That's why it's annoying as we go through, we're going to talk about the Santana comeback. Mm-hmm. I hate to even call it a comeback. Yeah. Because it's like, what does that even really mean? Oh, we can you know quote what I mean? the immortal poet LL Cool J. Mm. Don't call it a comeback. I've, I've been, been here, here for years. years. <laughs> Santana never went anywhere. I don't like calling it a comeback because this was all just part of his journey, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And he had to go through different times to get to where he eventually ended up. And where he eventually ended up, again, he's always following the music here. Yeah. He's never setting out to like, I want to make a top 40 album. Mm -hmm. He basically just got to a point where he was like, I want to make some more poppy kind of music and I want to collaborate with some newer artists. Yeah. It wasn't, I want to make a number one hit. Yeah. What's great about him, too, is, like, he can influence people and people can influence him. Like, Mm -hmm. right before he does, like, more pop and stuff like that when he's chilling with Miles, um, 
he influenced Miles. Miles started making more Latin jazz, more jazz fusion sounds. Like, can you imagine influencing Miles Davis? Yeah. With him influencing you. And Miles was the one that kind of told him, hey, man, you can do more than Black Magic Woman. Mm. You know, that's great, but you can do more than that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and then the pop was just a cherry on top of what is Santana because he did kind of reawaken my love for Santana. Mm-hmm. You know, all those older songs that came on classic radio, now they were newer songs. Now he's bringing a different artist that, right. like you, that are on top 40. Yeah. You know? And this is, so he had to go through a, a big personal journey to really get to this point. I was watching an interview with him. He was saying um, before he put out the album Supernatural, which won like, what, 10 Grammys, went like du- Double Diamond, whatever, yeah. huge album mm-hmm. in 99. Before that, he had to go through a big like spiritual transformation. Mm-hmm. Um, he was telling a story that he had a lot of anger issues, actually. Mm-hmm. And his wife was like, kind of like sat him down, was like, I really don't feel comfortable with like the anger that you have. I don't feel comfortable with this anger being around our children. Mm-hmm. I think you should go to therapy. Yeah. And he was like, I don't really want to go to therapy, but okay. <laughs> so he went to the therapist like six times. Nothing happened. Seventh time, he's talking. And this is all right from him. I'm not making this up. This is real shit. This isn't the maniac part. This actually <laughs> happened, according to Carlos himself. Go look it up. Um, and he's talking to the therapist. And then in the middle of it, the therapist is just like, let me ask you a question, Carlos. When you wake up in the morning... Why do you think that the whole world is out to screw you? Why is that your perception? And he was just kind of like, huh, (laughs) that's a good point. Maybe I'm having kind of a victim mentality right now. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just Clive. (laughs) Maybe it's all Clive. It's all part of Clive's master plan. (laughs) But yeah, no, he, um, he was like, yeah, like he had a lot of anger inside. Apparently he was like molested as a young boy. Yeah. When he's crossing the border, some American did that to him (laughs) and he had like a lot of anger from that obviously that he was working through and then like when he got to that kind of level of acceptance he said that the success that came after was his reward for basically going to that spiritual place and going through that journey yeah you know what i mean and it's just it's absolutely crazy what happened because he like we were saying he wanted to work with some newer artists Mm -hmm. and he puts out this hour this album supernatural yep which he's working with clive again clive davis yeah (laughs) Shout out to Clive. Why does, why does Clive only come when there's money involved? It's in huge success. It's crazy. It was, ah, oh, what did he say? He said some, some crazy spiritual shit to Clive. He was like, what I want to do is connect the music with the light. And, and, Clive, and, and Clive was like, basically what that means is that he wanted to make a radio-friendly record. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus Christ. Thanks for breaking it down, Clive. It's so funny because Carlos is so spiritual. Clive is such a businessman. It's just like the way, like them two talking about it, it's so different, but it's so funny to me that Clive knew what he was trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, um, Clive taught him more how to be a better businessman. Billy Graham taught him how to be like a huge artist mm. in a way. And then Clive was the money man. Clive, call us. We need some business tips. <laughs> Hit us up, Clive. Come on. We're in your city. <laughs> um, yeah, so he works with a bunch of new artists. He puts out the album Supernatural. goes absolutely huge. Mm-hmm. And this is really, it's funny because, you know, I was born in the 90s. The Santana that I knew the most growing up was this Santana. Uh-huh. Do-do-do-do-do. bum bum ba na ba na yeah yeah like that was the santana that i knew Mm -hmm. and i would have i think i would have discovered the older santana eventually you know as i listen to more music yeah but that was what made me know what santana was which made me curious about what else santana had done would you say that once you heard him you couldn't forget about it no (laughs) never i could never forget about it um but it's just um i want i just want to say i want to take a second to talk about his guitar style Mm mm-hmm and it's just amazing and you know like we said i mean we're a band we make music and i you know i don't want to i'm not going to make this all about us but i've been playing guitar for a long time yeah and i would say my top two influences on guitar would probably be david gilmore one and then santana number two okay um david gilmore was like a lot of what he was playing was like blues like pentatonic type stuff but Mm -hmm. what made him different was the feel that he put into it yeah yeah, yeah. but the actual notes that he was playing weren't really crazy Mm -hmm. it's pretty it's pretty 
bluesy. It's just the, the chords under it are crazy Pink Floyd style things, and yeah. he just has so much emotion into it. Absolutely. And once I kind of understood what he was doing there, I was like, okay, well, where else can you bring guitar? Mm. And I'm listening to Santana, and I'm listening to him play different notes. I'm listening to him playing outside of that kind of pentatonic blues box. Yeah. And there's certain songs like like Black Magic Woman where I'm I literally had to look up the guitar tile. I'm like, what note is he playing here that makes it sound like this? Mm -hmm. Like this is crazy. And I would have to look. I looked it up, and I'm just like, oh, so he's going instead of do 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 do. He's going do 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 do. And I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> where it is. And then like just because of that, kind of like expanded my whole idea of like the notes that you can play on a guitar right. and how to make it sound good. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's yeah. all because of Carlos and just again letting the muse and the music flow through him mm -hmm. like he's not imposing his will on the guitar yeah he's letting the guitar play itself yeah oh man that's good you know what i mean <laughs> and uh, it is what it is so yeah this all comes back to that album that he puts out and now all of a sudden he's huge mm -hmm. again everybody knows him again again <laughs> which is the funny part because it's like we're saying this is the comeback but as far as I'm concerned, he he didn't go anywhere. Right. And if this album never happened, he would still be completely happy with his life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Still be working. Still be making good music. Like, what? What do you want from him? <laughs> <laughs> Stop bothering him. Leave me alone, guys. <laughs> I'm Santana. I'm just doing Santana things. Yeah. That's what I do. But yeah, a lot of those songs are pretty much immortal, like, now. You know what I mean? I mean, you got artists that are not hitting on all cylinders right now that are on that album people remember them forever now you know what i mean i mean i know rob thomas mostly from that song yeah i know yeah. way more about that song than what band was he in matchbox 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 20? 20 yes, yes. yeah not matchbox 2020 <laughs> sure <laughs> And even, um, it was funny, I even saw an interview with Rob Thomas where he was talking about it. He's like, yeah, Santana came up to me. He was just like, hey, man, I want to make the light coalesce with the music and the blah, blah, blah. And he was like, I didn't really know everything he was talking about. But the way that he said it, I was like, I'm on board. <laughs> like, I'm into this. And like, it's so, you would never expect that to, like, on paper, you wouldn't think that would work. Mm -hmm. You're like, let's take this dude who was huge. 30 years ago, who's a guitar player and match him up with like the singer of this pop band. Yeah. Like this indie-ish kind of pop band. Yep. And yep. see what happens. And it ends up being like the biggest song in the world for yeah. a while. For a while. And then that other song too, the Maria Maria. Maria Maria. I mean, that's a beautiful song. I personally don't know who that artist is that sings. I, I watched him perform it just the other day while I was looking at the research and that's mm. the first time I actually saw his face because mm. I wasn't really into watching too many videos and stuff like that, but listening to music definitely. And I've never seen his face until like this week. And yeah. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but I know that voice. Santana knows him. Exactly. Reminds me of a West Side story. Yeah. Um, and then again, yeah. So now he's just, he can't go anywhere without being noticed. Everybody, he's back in the public eye. He's winning Grammys. Mm -hmm. What helps is that he hasn't really aged much terribly. So he pretty much looks like he did on stage at Woodstock. It's just the hair is longer. He's a little bit heavier mm -hmm. and he's a little bit grayer. But yes. pretty much that's him. That's the thing that's so interesting. It's like, it really feels like he's always been that guy. Yeah. He's always been that guy that just loves music mm -hmm. and wants to like we've been saying this whole time and let the music flow through him mm -hmm. and go where the music wants to take him yeah that yeah. he's always been that guy yeah. and you can go back you, you can look at an interview from a year ago you can look at an interview from 40 years ago the look in his eyes exactly the same yeah yeah he's the jimmy page of his genre <laughs> let us know your secrets guys only just a little bit more spiritual <laughs> just a little bit and it is really funny like when I think of Santana, like, I really think of the spiritual aspect of it, almost more than I think of even the music aspect of it. I still can't believe that he doesn't sing. And as a little girl, I felt like that, like, hearing songs like Black Magic Woman, I'm like, and I'm just, like, confused and still in shock. And part of me still is, it's like, that's not him singing? And he doesn't want to sing? You know why, right? Why doesn't Santana sing? Because the guitar sings for him. There you go. That's all it is. That's yeah. really what it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's so interesting, like, we... We did um, some reaction videos to Santana before, and it's like listening to the music, it sounds spiritual. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it came from the earth. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like really distinctive. Like, I don't know any other artist that makes me feel 
that exactly that same way like when I'm listening to Santana. Yeah. Like I can really feel that energy that he's talking about, that mm-hmm. kind of mystical energy in and the, the music. rhythm, the rhythm of the earth, like kind of like the beat of the planet in a yeah. way too. I know what you're saying, definitely. Um, yeah. And then his art, it's all encompassing. It's like everything is a part of it. So like the album art, the cover mm-hmm. art, that too. It's like you're drawn in. You already know the vibe that you're going to be on, but you yeah. definitely, you most likely don't know the sound yet. But right. seeing the album, you know the vibe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's Santana. <laughs> <laughs> but ever since um, that Supernatural album, he's just been... I mean, he was already a legend, but it's like he's a double legend? He's a double is legend that, Is that a thing? Yeah. Because he literally went all the way up to the top, did his thing, went all the way back to the top without ever switching up. Yeah. That is the most important thing. Yeah. There was never a time where he's like fuck this thing that I've been doing. I want to do this because I want to make more money. Right. Never. Yeah. I don't even think that ever crossed his mind. Mm -hmm. All he ever wanted to do was go where the music took him. And the music took him to the top. Mm -hmm. Little slump. Right back to the top. Yeah. It's insane. And ever since that album has come out, I mean, he's just been even more famous. Mm -hmm. He's been even more known. But he still seems like he has, like, relatively very small ego. Yeah, yeah. I love that about him. I love that about some of our favorite guitarists. That's pretty cool. Him and Angus Young. We'll put them in that box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But again, um, the spiritual aspect of Santana is really what shines through the most. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, even though I love his guitar playing so much, it's just the it's just the feeling of it, mm-hmm. you know? And that's something that you can't replicate. Yeah. You kind of feel like, okay, here it is. When you hear him play, you're like, I'm safe here. Nobody's going to take me to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's trying to get me drugged up or uh, liquored up. Right. They just want to take care of me musically. He's like, come with me. <laughs> Let me show you the way. You're like, okay. <laughs> Whatever, Carlos. <laughs> Where are the guitars? You're like, whoa, man, should I be going down this way? I'm going like, to go. Relax. But I'm scared the whole I'm time. I'm not trying to burn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, damn, I feel like this is short, but I feel like it's just like how much, what, what else do we have to say? He's the fucking, aw- he's the best. Like, he's the man. He just has the best guitar style. I, it's so memorable and you just feel every single thing that he's playing. Yeah. And I'm trying to think, I mean, obviously he's put out way more music, but I mean, as far as like the general outline of his career, like that's, that's how it went. Yeah. But I mean, like what else, do, I mean, he's still putting out music. Still to this day. His music teaches you like musical patience too Mm. you know you put a song on and you're not going to get it all in three minutes like Mm. you know or two minutes and it's going to be hook this and then it's over you know it's like it's it's an experience just like him and i guess his musical career and stuff too listening to him is like an experience right you put him on let's say you're going to cook something you might make the best meal you ever made that day (laughs) just listening to santana he's like a mozart you know what i'm saying yeah why not yeah and that's why we love him Uh and it's it's not only because he tears a guitar up so much but he's just a genuine person yeah and it's like especially in music when you're talking about really famous people it's very hard to come across people that come that seem that genuine Mm -hmm. but really just in life i feel like it's hard and i don't know the guy like that right but he just seems like such a real dude yeah like he doesn't his head is here it is not up here yeah you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and i just love that about him and it's like i i love him as a person just as much as i love his guitar style and the music that he makes yeah you know what i mean yeah. yeah yeah a conversation with him must be like epic you know Oh, yeah. I feel like talking to him would just make you feel like you're tripping. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Because everything you said is like, you got to just listen to the vibrations of the world, man. Like, he's st- and he even said, he's like, look, I am what I am. I'm a hippie from the 60s, and I haven't changed, and this is what I do. Yeah. And I've seen him say that. Yeah. And it's just so true. And you can just feel it. That's the thing that's so cool. Yeah. Is you can listen to a Santana album from last year. You can listen to a Santana album from the 60s. It gives you that same feeling. Yeah. Yeah, even the way he talks about, let's say he talks about Miles Davis. He's like, Miles Davis, his music, he is, it's water. <laughs> I'm like, and I you're get like, that, ah. man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he had actually, I'm glad that you said that, because that just reminded me of something he said, which is maybe my favorite way of explaining a guitar solo I've ever heard. Uh-huh. He said he always wants to contrast with what the band is doing when he's playing lead. Oh, yeah. So this is what he said. This is going to... If you're not watching on YouTube and if you're listening on audio, this is going to seem, this isn't going to make any sense. But if you're watching on YouTube, this is going to make sense. Mm-hmm. So he says, if the band is going like this, 
then I want to go like that. <laughs> and if the band's going like that, then I want to go like this. Yes. And it's so funny because somebody that doesn't know music might be like, what the fuck are you talking about, guy? <laughs> But when I saw him say that, I was like, that's so true. <laughs> that is so true. I totally that is get the it. goal. Yeah. And ever since I heard him say that, whenever I, I play a guitar solo, I'm like, okay, so if the band is doing this, mm -hmm. then what can I do to go like that? Yeah. But then I'm like, well, maybe I'm thinking too much now. And I just need to turn my brain off and let the music happen. Open yourself to the music. And it's like, he literally has changed the way that I think about music. Yeah, that's really cool. Because you literally become an ingredient, like your own ingredient to the mix. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, if you're doing it right, it's not like, I'm making this happen. Yeah. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Like, no, you're just part of it. Yeah. There's all these things happening around you in these spiritual planes that we can't really tap into. Mm -hmm. As long as you're open to it and you let it come through you, that's all you can do. Yeah. And it is funny, like, because some people just are more, you know, open, I guess artists are just more, whatever, conducive to that in general. Yeah. Because yeah. I do think about it, I'm like, sometimes, you know, I don't know about you, but I'll be da walking down the street, I just hear music on Me the too. street. Yeah. Right? Like, from the beeping of a car horn, to the running of a motor, Me to too. people yelling in the distance. Yeah. You can just kind of hear a song. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I guess some people don't hear things like that they probably have other things that they have like they probably see things differently or mm -hmm. they probably you know think of things differently computer I, analyzation one two three four they yeah like or, or stuff like that <laughs> um but it's like yeah like you can just the muses are real yeah. and you just have to be open to them and it's let true. what it even it it doesn't have to, again it doesn't have to be music it doesn't have to be art it could be writing yeah it's like there's words floating around there's ideas floating around are you going to listen to them right or are you going to let your own resistance stop you mm-hmm and that's what it all comes down to. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I was talking about in that book, um, art, The War, War of Art, art. that mm -hmm. really changed my perception. And then when I see Carlos Santana, I'm like, that's a guy that lives that shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's just, it is what it is. Yeah. I, I'm, I, my goal is to end up like that. There's parts of you that are just like, oh man, I don't want to like go crazy, but like maybe you should. You but know? like what is crazy? Exactly. Exactly. A little crazy can be good. <laughs> oh, we're never gonna survive. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what I want to leave you guys on. A little crazy <laughs> could be good. Uh -huh. All right, controlled crazy. <laughs> Music maniacs say, "Be controlled crazy, and everything will be okay in your life." Everything will be all right. And that's that's basically it. Well, we did it, guys. We talked about Carlos Santana. Let us know um, all the other important things that you feel we should have mentioned in the comments. We want to keep the discussion going, right? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I feel like we missed a lot just because I was so excited to talk about just, like, his vibe. Yeah. Like, it's like it's not even, like, a matter of, like, the history of, like, this happened and this happened. It's just, like, just thinking about Santana, it's just, like, I just think about the feeling that I get when I'm listening to Santana. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's a great thing that he's still here and looks like there's still more music to make, mm -hmm. like, you know? So that's awesome. Yeah, he is forever a legend, and he will always be a legend. Yeah. As, as far as music goes, as far as guitar playing in particular goes. Absolutely. It per definitely in particular yeah <laughs> every guitar player i know is like santana's a fucking beast yes you yes. know what i mean mm -hmm. and he's not cocky about it which makes it even cooler uh-huh but um yeah clearly we really like santana do you guys like santana <laughs> if you do let us know in the comments we'd love to hear about what santana means to you if there's any like specific like experiences that you've had to listening to santana yeah like any crazy experiences that you had like spiritual awakenings at like his concerts and stuff mm-hmm because that's what he said the most rewarding thing about music is for him to play live and for him to see people like get it yeah that's you know what be, i mean yeah i'm sure that's awesome so if you guys have ever had that kind of experience like i really want to hear about it because i think it's so cool yeah and he's not an energy hoarder like you know modern day rappers and stuff they're not coming to steal your energy you know santana's there to share his you're there to share yours and we're all part of it okay yes so really <laughs> uh something like that <laughs> So, um, really the main thing here is that Santana lives the fucking music. Yeah. And that's, that's just what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, if you live the music, then like this video, <laughs> leave a review of the podcast or whatever. Yep. Um, if you want to support the podcast so we could keep doing this, do more episodes and stuff, uh, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash music maniacs. Uh -huh. Um, and until then, we're out of here. We're going to go listen to some Tan Santana. All right. Yeah.